سلام علیکم و رحمت الله و برکاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحیم All praises are Allah's the Lord of all worlds and may his peace and blessings be upon our master the holy prophet Muhammad and his pure immaculate ahlul bayt اللهم صل على محمد و آل محمد و اجل فرجه It's a great pleasure and honor and a delight to be with you brothers and sisters once again here. And uh, I was here two months ago and this time my, my wife and child wanted to come. I said, why can't we come? Yes. So I told my wife, I was a second, second year medical student when I got married. She was a first year engineering student. So I did medicine, she did engineering. But after medicine I went into the seminary to the hoses. But she continued with the engineering. So I told her, if you had come to the Hose too, you would have been invited to America. <laughs> so our 13 year old son now is seriously considering entering the Hose now. Anyway, okay. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Ma yakhruj min baytihi muhajiran ila Allahi wa rasoolay thumma yudrikhu al-mawt فَقَدْ وَقَعَ أَجْرُهُ عَلَى اللَّهِ Part of verse number 100 in chapter 4, Surah An-Nisa, reads, Whoever leaves his house migrating towards Allah and his messenger and is then overtaken by death, his reward shall certainly fall on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right, this verse has an external meaning to it and it has many esoteric sides and dimensions affixed to it as well. The external meaning, those who are suffering in lands of atheism, cough, where they're oppressed in different lands, well, this doesn't apply to you lot because in LA, America, I don't think you're oppressed at all. You're living comfortable lives as Muslims. Although I haven't been here, but in England, we have five million Muslims and they, have, they can live their Islamic lives very well. But here, the verse concerns those who are living in lands where they're being oppressed, where they can't live Islam. They want to move out. This is too close for them, yes. <laughs> Yes, okay. Yeah, so those who are living in lands where the rulers of those lands don't let them practice Islam, okay, uh, and they're oppressing these people. The verse concerns those people, the external side of the verse. Those people, they can go to lands of Islam. Sorry. They can flee those lands of oppression and go to lands of Islam, there's no problem there. It needs a lot of faith to make that decision though. So those who leave their homes in that situation, okay, not those who are in America or in England, but there may be parts in the world where this kind of oppression is there. How muhajiran ilallah wa rasulih Migrating, so they want to exit their homes. How? By migrating towards Allah. Lands where Allah's rule predominates. Thumma yudrik hulmaut. Then death, they're overtaken by death. They die in this root of theirs. They pass away. There's a lot of thawab and reward for such people. The decision they made, the niyyah they made, they will get their reward in the hereafter. That's the external side. However, it has many esoteric dimensions here affixed to it. And in all verses of the Quran, there's always an external exoteric side, which most of us, if we read the Arabic or even the translation, will be familiar with the explicit understand and reading of the Quran. But there are esoteric dimensions, the butun, which is difficult. And here in this verse and a few other verses and one story, 
I'm going to explain this esoteric side to the verses of the Quran. The esoteric side has to come to us via the infallible Imams. We can't understand the esoteric part of the Quran ourselves. That the Imams have to inform us. And we have many traditions. Traditions by the holy Imams, and the holy prophet of Islam, where they tell us what the esoteric meanings to these external verses of the Quran are. However, we can't ourselves tell the people what the esoteric side is. And even if we're certain that the esoteric dimension of this specific verse is this, we have to say, maybe this is an esoteric explanation of the verse. We could never say it with certainty. That's why many of the scholars, when they speak about the esoteric side, which isn't in the traditions, they all say, maybe, muhtamadun, that this is the esoteric meaning and so forth. So, whoever flees from the house, migrating towards Allah and His Prophet, and then death is over, overtakes them, they have a high reward. This is the external side. Now let's go through the esoteric dimensions of this. Mayakhruj min baytihi. Whoever exits one's ego, the soul, because, you know, if the soul, the ego, overtakes you, it's the beginning of the end. Who, wh whoever exits, though, one's ego, is not captivated by one's nafs. This is Imam Khomeini's explanation in his tafsir on Surah Al-Hamd. Whoever exits one's ego has succeeded in flying away, escaping from one's ego. How muhajiran il Allah whilst wayfaring, spiritual wayfaring, muhajir, being a muhajir, flying from place to place. Here, it's referring to Sayyidu Suluk here. Muhajiran ila Allah. It's telling you how to exit the ego. Whoever exits one's ego whilst doing muhajiran ila Allah, whilst spiritually wayfaring towards Allah, Here, in the external side, is the person who's acquired that faith which made him make the decision to fly from those lands of oppression. With exiting one's ego, both the exoteric and esoteric sides, they're both manifestations of the same reality. It's only when you exit your ego, you can make such difficult decisions to fly from places of oppression to Darul Islam. So, whoever exits one's ego, doing Sayyidu Suluk, going towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Thumma yudrikul maut, and then death overtakes them. Now, we've, we've said what the external meaning of that is. What's the esoteric sign of this death? Of this death? In Islam, there are many protocols, protocols given by the verses of the Qur'an and the traditions of the Ahlul Bayt where these protocols offer ways of spiritual wayfaring. They tell you how you have to reach Allah. It's all based on traditions of the Ahlul Bayt. Thumma yudrikul maut. Death overtakes them. Before they get the reward, death overtakes them. Now what does this mean esoterically? This is referring to, according to Imam, he's saying that exiting the ego is a very difficult thing. Is there a sign to tell you that you've succeeded in exiting the ego? And he says, yes. Following from the verse, he says, thumma yudrikul maut. Death overtakes them. What does death mean in Sayyidu Suluk? During one's muhajiran ila Allah, what meaning does death here? Yeah, death means you've killed the ego. There's no ego anymore. You've eliminated all traces of the ego. Of this me, I'm this, I'm that, I'm the best. It's very difficult. Once the I, this ego, the I dies, 
It's as if you're a newborn Muslim again. Now you have the means of attaining to Allah, reuniting with Him, seeing Him. So this is thumma yudrikul maut. This is what it means here. Now seeing Allah by means of killing the ego, and we'll speak more about this thing in a minute, but this is the objective, and I sp we spoke about, we started speaking about Sayyidu Suluk two months ago, and I'll continue on this debate, inshallah. But we said before that the objective in Sayyidu Suluk is seeing Allah, and we explained what we meant there, and I'll touch upon it just in case brothers and sisters weren't there. So, now you've killed the ego, you're doing muhajira, wayfaring towards Allah. فَقَدْ وَقَعَ أَجْرُهُ عَلَى اللَّهِ For them there's a reward, عَلَى اللَّهِ This is that when they use the preposition عَلَى It means this reward only Allah will suffice them now, reward-wise. Giving them the heavens is good, but they want more. This is a very high stage of Islamic faith here, eliminating one's ego. They want more. They like the heavens, but it, they, they expect much more. Whether you give them the heavens or not, it's almost as if it's irrelevant to them. They're told that you won't go to hell. That's also very good. But they want more than that too. There's something more. Here, they want Allah's presence, first and foremost. Even if they're in hell, they don't want to be disconnected from that presence. And there's a clause in Du'ai um, Komail, which sheds some light in this aspect. Even if I'm in hell, I don't want to be far from you though. They want something much more than the heavens and the earth. For someone like me, I would love to go into heaven, and that would suffice for me. Someone who's of more faith than me, they, they, what would be sufficient for them is not going to hell, maybe. But there are some people, heaven and hell is neither here nor there. Once you see Allah, it's His presence which counts. Then in the verse it says, Muhajiran ilallah wa rasulih. Why was it necessary to make this conjunction? Why, why do you have to conjoin Rasulihi to Allah? Just say ilallah. What would be so wrong with that? Because it's the same root, the way of Allah and the way of the Prophet of Islam is one and the same. Maybe here it's referring to the fact that you know, everything that exists in this world is a manifestation of Allah's names and attributes. But the most complete manifestation of Allah's names, and not all of Allah's names and attributes, but those names and attributes which we can be a manifestation of, because there are some attributes we can't, no one can. But with, with respect to those attributes we can become a manifestation, the most complete existent on earth, or anywhere in the world, is that of the Holy Prophet of Islam. No one was more complete manifestation-wise to the Holy Prophet of Islam. Maybe that's an, referring to that. Okay. Now, who, who's the traveler then? Who is this traveler to Allah? And we've mentioned this before when I was here. The traveler is the immaterial, rational spirit. That's the essence of what we are. The means of traveling, we said, was the body, the world in general. Without the world, without the body, we can't act. We exist. In Barzakh, in Hades, we exist. But we can't do Salat, for example. We can't spiritually elevate ourselves too significantly. So the means of travel for us is in this world. It's the, the world, the body. And we said that before the creation of time and space, before the creation of the sun, moon, the essence of what we are was created. 
in the realm of Ala Madhar, free temporal phase of existence. And there, all beings were there. And we were asked by Allah, would you, are you ready to be my representative on earth? And there, our spirit, which was incorporated with the fitra, which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala inserted in the spirit, since the fitra was refined and pure, we all accepted. We all decided to come on earth. It was all our decisions. So if your child once tells you, why did you give, why did you procreate me, or why am I here? Tell them it was your own decision. But uh, there we all accepted and gave the pledge of allegiance to be Allah's representative on earth. Then we came on earth with the body and so on and so forth. But the pledge was made there. There we were all believers, even the worst of criminals today. There they were true muwahids, monotheists. They believed in Nubawa, they believed in Ma'ad. Everyone was pure there. Everyone was in Allah's presence there. Everyone saw Allah there. The aim of Sayyidu Suluk in this world now is to return to that fitra, to see Allah. Now, I want to give a number of traditions now. This much I explained before when I was here last time. I just thought, just to give a short summary. I want to give three traditions now, just supporting what I've said. And then we'll continue, inshallah. One of the companions of Imam Ridha, alayhi salam, narrated that some disbelievers asked Imam Ridha, لِمَحْتُجِبَ Allah," Because why, why is Allah veiled? Veiled from us seeing Him. Because we said, the aim in Sayyidu Suluk is seeing Allah. They said, why is Allah veiled from us? Why can't we see Him? The Imam replied, إِنَّ الْحِجَابَ عَنِ الْخَالِقِ This veiling you talk about is in your own hands. It's, it's, it's a result of your own actions. It's on behalf of yourselves, on behalf of the existence. Don't say it's Allah's fault. In al hijaba, verily, this veiling, and al khalq, li kithrat due to the abundance of their sins. This veiling of that fitra, this veiling, of, this barrier which prevents you from seeing Allah. The Imam says is because of the, the sins you carry out. Otherwise, the Imam continues, فَأَمَّا هُوَ Concerning Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, فَلَا يَخْفَى عَلَيْ خَافِيَةٌ فِي آنَاءِ اللَّيْلِ وَالنَّهَارِ Otherwise, with Allah, no veil is concealing him throughout any moment, throughout the day and night. He's never concealed. You're putting the barrier upon yourselves. You're preventing yourselves from seeing him. So this was the first tradition. The second tradition, Imam Sadiq alayhi salam narrates that a scholar had approached Imam Ali, Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam, and said, Ya Amir al-Mu'mineen, Hal ra'ayta rabbak hina abattahu? So the scholar asked the Imam, do you see, again the word seeing is used, do you see your Lord when you worship Him? فَقَالْ وَيْلَكْ Amir al-Mu'minin said, woe upon you. مَا كُنْتُ أَعْبُدُوا رَبًّا لَمْ أَرَى I've never worshipped a Lord I've, I can't see. This is Imam saying this, of course I see my Lord. The scholar said, قَالْ وَكَيْفَ رَأَيْتَهُ He said, so how do you see him? Then the Imam replied, وَيْلَكْ لَا تُدْرِكُهُ الْأُيُونَ فِي مُشَاهَدَةِ الْأَبْصَارِ Physical eyes don't see him. Physical eyes can't see him. Woe upon you. That's impossible. 
for the physical eye to see, that's not possible. But our seeing is something else. وَلَكِنْ رَأَتْهُ الْقُلُوبِ بِحَقَائِقِ الْإِيمَانِ Rather, it's the hearts that see Allah by the essence of faith. And the scholars say it's by that fitra we see Allah. By refining it, by not doing any sins. It's only by this route we see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now the third tradition, which is the most relevant for this discussion today, so please if you, if you haven't been paying attention until now, if you just concentrate this here. Abu Basir, one of the companions of Imam Sadiq salam, asked the Imam, Imam Sadiq salam, هَلْ يَرَاهُ الْمُؤْمِنُونَ يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ هَلْ يَرَاهُ Again, seeing. Do the mu'mineen, the believers, see Allah on the day of resurrection? Because in the beginning, in all Amadar, we all saw him. The question here is, do we see him on the day of resurrection? And according to the verse of the Quran, we do see him. We're united with him, but not with the physical eye. So he said, do we see him on the day of resurrection? That's the question. The Imam replied, Naam. Wa qad ra'awhu qabla yawm al He said, yes, you, you do see him on the day of resurrection. But we also see him before the day of resurrection. We see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Mata, when, when is that? The Abu Basir asked. The Imam replied, Hina qala lahum alastu bi rabbikum qalu bala He said the Imam replied when in all amazar Allah said alastu bi rabbikum am I not your lord and you all said yes so it's you know certifying that we saw him then then the Imam paused for a while and then he said this statement and this is the important part so if you still haven't been a Paying attention until now, it's not it's still not too late. Then the Imam said this: "In al mu'minina la yarawnahu fi dunya, fi dunya qabla yom al qiyama, alastu tarahu fi waktu kahada." Verily, the believers may certainly see him in this world, the dunya, before the day of resurrection. So, in the Seyl Suluk, the objective is seeing Allah. Who? Who's doing the seeing? It's me, the I, the immaterial emotional spirit. How? By refining the fitra, the fitra which was untouched in the day of Alastu. In this world, okay, there are barriers, we have to retain that, or return to it. Refine the fitra, and then we can see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So that's the conclusion up to here. And that's why they say the slogan of the Orafa is Inna Lilla wa inna ilahi rajiun. Verily, we're all Allah's wa inna ilahi rajiun. We're all returning to Him in order to see Him in this world. Okay. Now in order to see him, we said that we have to eliminate this ego. That's the number one barrier in us seeing him. And there's a tradition which states, nafsuk." The mother of idols, the mother of your enemies, the worst of enemies, is your I. This I-ness that you have. I'm this, I'm that. It's that ego. It's the worst of enemies. Okay? Sometimes we use, we make up enemies for ourselves. But in essence, it's yourself. You're behaving negatively towards yourself. Many people are Muslims on the outside, but they're worshipping their ego rather than worshipping Allah. And then the nafs in these circumstances even evolves from being a human to that of something else. Next Saturday I'll speak about this issue in more depth. 
What I mean by the evolution of the nafs from human to that of being animals. But until this ego isn't broken, Allah can't be seen. You, you have, you're veiling yourself. The fitra is always there. It's, it never changes, the fitra. It's untouched. But you keep on veiling it. The fitra is always one and the same. But by veiling it, putting you know, curtain over curtain over it, you're preventing yourself from seeing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This unveiling, this process of unveiling is important. Otherwise the fitra itself never changes. Within every human being, the pure fitra, that person can, even if he's an atheist at present, the fitra is there. That's why some people can, in a mere moment, suddenly change from being a worst of atheist to a proper Muslim, if the environment is there. Maybe the example of Hor is one example one can use here. But the ego has to be broken. This heart that we all have is a container. It can't have both egoism and divinity. It's one or the other. You can't have both. So you must exit this ego and then fly towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay, now I want to go through one or two uh, stories and parts of the Quran which is on the same issue and then we'll finish inshallah. This eliminating of the ego is not a difficult, it's not a simple thing. As they say in England, it's not everyone's cup of tea. It's something, I don't know what they say here, but it's not everyone's glass of Pepsi, maybe. Yeah. But it's difficult. And one will never know if one will succeed in doing this. But the important thing is one has to intend, have the intention to break this ego. One may never succeed. But as long as the intention is there, that has a lot of reward in it. Now one person who didn't succeed is Iblis. And he was a very pious brother, Iblis, yes. He was someone who, I don't think the Irfan which Iblis had before this era, I don't think anyone in this room had even one hundredth of that Iman, even a thousandth maybe. He was so high in faith that Allah allowed him to join the ranks of the angels. He wasn't an angel, but he was granted that permission to join the ranks, to join the ranks of the angels. This was something very high. Okay, Surah Al-A'raf. Let's go through these verses one by one. Qala ma mana'aka alla tasjuda idh amartuk. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said to Iblis, because the command was given for him to prostrate before Adam. Now this prostration wasn't a prostration that we do, you know, the sujood. That's a technical term in fiqh as we go on the floor. This sujood literally means being very humble before someone. So the order was given to Iblis to be very humble before Adam. Allah said, what prevented you from bowing down or doing this sajda when I had commanded you to do so? Qala ana khayrun min khalaqtani min nar wa khalaqtahu min teen the Satan said, I am better than him. I. See, the ego came in his way. I am better than him. You should never say, I am better than this person or that person. Even if you're the best of scholars or whatever, and the other person has a very low, let's say, socio-economic class, no knowledge, no nothing. Never regard yourselves better than anyone, whatever your position is. Anachirumin. You created me from fire, خلقتني من نار, but you created him from clay. So of course I'm better. It's kind of analogical reasoning uh, he used. There's some school of thoughts in Islam, they use this kind of qiyas. I don't know, maybe Iblis was 
a flower from that school. But anyway, <laughs> but uh, he created me from fire. I'm from fire. He's from earth. He's from clay. I'm better than him. No. No one's better than anyone. Qala, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is verse 13 of Surah Al-A'raf now. Fahbit minha fama yakunu lak an tatakabbara fiha fakhruj innaka mina sagirin. Descend from this realm, Allah said. Be gone with. It is not for you to be arrogant here in this realm. Because this egoism is tantamount to arrogance. This arrogance is a very important phase one has to undergo throughout one's life. Moment to moment, if you give way to arrogance, it's the beginning of your downfall. So be gone with, it's not for you to be arrogant here, get out of here. For you're amongst the wretched, the most wretched of creatures. Then verse 14 reads, قال Iblis said, أَنذَرْنِي إِلَى يَوْمِ الْقِيَامَةِ Grant me respite until the day إِلَى يَوْمَ يُبْعَثُونَ Until the day they're raised up, until that day of resurrection, grant me this respite, this time of rest, a time which I want to do something, where I can be free to do something. قَالَ إِنَّكَ مِنَ الْمُنْذَرِينَ Allah said, okay, be amongst those who have been given respite. And then Iblis said, قَالْ فَبِمَا أَغْوَيْتَنِي لَأَغْعُدَنَّ لَهُمْ سِرَاتَكَ الْمُسْتَقِيمِ Iblis said, because you've thrown me, because you, Allah, have thrown me from the right path. You see, it's very interesting this, because some schools of thought of, amongst the Muslims, there are schools of thought which believe even our actions are predestined. This is what Iblis is saying. So I think it's a very strong probability that Iblis did belong to this school of thought. Because he says, Now you've thrown me off the path. As if Allah was the cause of his own wrongdoing. As if Allah was the cause that he sent. No, we didn't believe in such thing. I will lie in wait for them on the straight path. Now, this, this next verse, we're continuing, this is the main focus of why I even brought this part of the Qur'an for this talk. Then, okay, now this is the case, I will attack them from their front, from before them, and behind them, from their right and from their left. That's what the Iblis is saying. Now this, the external meaning, here once again, the Iblis is on the attack. It's going to attack us from the front, back, left and right. But here it has many esoteric dimensions once again fixed to it. And th this esoteric dimension is definitive because one of the Imams have informed us of this esoteric dimension. Imam Baghir alayhi salam ثُمَّ لَآتِيَنَّهُمْ مِنْ بَيْنَ أَيْدِيهِمْ I'll attack them from the front. The Imam, the holy Imam says, this means I'll make them devalue the significance of the Day of Resurrection. You know, the Day of Resurrection is before us. Okay, it's in front of us. The Satan, or Iblis, is going to try and devalue the significance of this Day of Resurrection for us, so that we devalue it. Because once we devalue and the important, there will be less fear. Then that may lead us to sin, and so on and so forth. From behind them, Imam says, the Iblis by saying this, he's saying that I'll make them desire the amassing and gathering of wealth and being miserly so that they can collect more and more and leave more and more for their inheritors. Because this abundance of wealth, 
this can also, this love of one's wealth and keeping it in for oneself, for one's family, and not spending and get, you know, doing enfog and so on and so forth, this can be a cause of one's downfall. وَعَنْ أَيْمَانِهِمْ From their right, Imam Baqir says, I shall sensationalize sins and deviations before them, that they think that these sins are good. The things which are deviations in essence are very seeming for these believers, those who are on the straight path. Things which are wrong, according to the Sharia, I'll make them think it's, it's very good, it's good, make it attractive to them. And by doing this, I'll make them lose their deen, their faith. That was from the right. وَعَنْ شَمَائِلِهِمْ The Imam says, right, I'll sweeten the soul's passions and lusts before them. Once one gets drowned in the, with the soul's passions, either one's sexual appetite, one's nutritional appetite, these kind of passions and souls, I'll sweeten them so much that they'll remember Allah, they'll recall Allah less and less. So th this was the esoteric side to these verses. And then the verse 18 says, قَالَ اخْرُجْ مِنْهَا مَذْعُومًا مَدْهُورًا لَمَنْ تَبِعَكَ مِنْهُمْ لَأَمْلَأَنَّ جَهَنَّمَ مِنْكُمْ أَجْمَعِينَ Get out from here, you're indeed disgraced and expelled. If any of them, if any of the believers, follow you, I will fill hell with you all. So if you don't want to be disgraced in this world and be expelled and not to enter hell, you have to, this protocol which Imam Baqir has given us here, we have to follow it and practice it. Now I'll end with one last story, which I, I think I gave this story um, during these two weeks. I'll be giving a story every day or every two days. Stories of the Qur'an, Qisas al-Qur'an. And there I'll be touching upon the esoteric dimensions to these stories. Because all these stories, they have an external meaning which is evident. But what does the chopping of the fingers and hands mean in the story of Yusuf? What, does the, what did the ant, the queen ant, say to Suleiman? What did that mean? These all have esoteric dimensions attached to it. The story of Adam and the tree. The story of David and Goliath, Jalut and um, um, Talut. These, they have an external meaning, but their essence, though, esoterically, are stories which all apply to this ego and how we have to eliminate it. The esoteric sides to them. And we'll go through this, but today I want to mentioned the story of Hazrat Ibrahim and the four birds. I think I mentioned this story last time in um, Yasin Institute, so forgive me for if this is a repeat. But um, I'm going to add one or two aspects to it this time, I go one step deeper, inshallah. Now, before I give the story though, I want to explain about the concept of yaqeen, certitude. As you know, there are three types of yaqeen. Ilm al-yaqeen, ayn al-yaqeen, and haqq al-yaqeen. They're both, they're all three of them are certitude. But one certitude, ilm al-yaqeen, is certitude via one's knowledge. Ayn al-yaqeen is a certitude which has been acquired by seeing. And haqq al-yaqeen is a certitude by means of attributes. I'll explain what that means in a minute. Ayatollah Jawadi Amuli, in order to describe these three types of certitude, he gives a medical example. He says when, and this medical example concerns heart transplantations. He says when you're a student, a medical student, first year, second year, third year, the teacher, the professor there speaks about heart transplantations, how they're done, what you have to do, all the ins and outs. And when you receive this knowledge from the teacher, 
you have yaqeen that heart transplantations are a reality, it can be done. That's ilmul yaqeen. With, with, with respect to Allah and ilmul yaqeen is this burhan and logic and philosophy which one comes about. It doesn't have to be philosophy, I mean, even with one's fitra, but it, the knowledge, each to their own level, can lead one to believe that there is an Allah. For you to acknowledge Allah, ilm al here means you have that amount of knowledge which is enough for you to have yaqeen that Allah exists. For you to acknowledge Allah. And any, anyone, even all people, you don't have to be a scholar. Each to their own degree of knowledge can attain to this. And you know in usul al it's haram to do taqlid. That's, I mean, you have to attain to this belief that there is an Allah, that there is Allah, Allah exists uh, by yourself, but by whatever means which is enough. With Ain al Yaqeen, Aghay Jawadi says that through your years as a medical student, then after a number of years, you begin to, they let it allow you in the operating room and you can see heart transplantations with your own eye. You can now see them. This is one step higher than the previous step, faith-wise. Before, you acknowledge that heart transplantations are a reality. Now you, you're, you're seeing heart transplantations actually being done. This is Ainul Yaqeen. Now with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, this Ainul Yaqeen is that seeing which we were speaking about. And that's done by means of uh, refining the fitra, not sinning and so on and so forth. We can all acknowledge that there is Allah, Allah exists, but not all of us can see Allah because that requires this refining of the fitra which is difficult, this elimination of the ego and so on and so forth. Then haqqul yaqeen, here this certitude by means of attributes, is when, Rejavadi says, when now you're a surgeon, a heart surgeon, the attribute of you being a transplanter qualifies. Now you're a transplanter now. You've acquired the, the attribute of transplanting in relation to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is when you've acquired manifestations of His names and attributes. There, that's haqqul yaqeen. That's even higher than aynul yaqeen. Now, these forms of yaqeen uh, are demonstrated in this story of the Qur'an with chapter 2, Surah Al-Baqarah, verse 260. وَإِذْ قَالَ إِبْرَاهِيمُ رَبِّي أَرْنِي كَيْفَ تُحْيِي الْمَوْتَى Prophet Ibrahim said to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Rabbi, O oh Lord, أَرْنِي كَيْفَ تُحْيِي الْمَوْتَى Show me how you bring the dead alive again. Now this is a prophet saying this. He wants to see this. But more than seeing, he wants to actually himself have that attribute of muhyi for himself to bring the dead alive again. Because he was a prophet at the time, so there was no problem with ilm al -yaqeen. Hazrat Ibrahim, he had the ilm al part. He was a prophet after all, I mean. He also had ain al uh, In one chapter of the Qur'an, if I've... I don't know if I've written it down anywhere here. I, I don't have it here, but... Um, uh, I, don't, I don't know the ayah off my heart. Uh, yes. Anyway, the ayat translated is when we showed Ibrahim the dominions of the heavens and the earth. Ibrahim saw all the existing realities behind the curtains. Allah showed him that. So he had Ainul Yaqeen too, that Yaqeen by means of seeing. However, he didn't have Haqqul Yaqeen at that time. He wanted to, he wanted to know how Allah brings the dead alive again. This attribute of mohi 
he wanted to have this attribute and he wanted to, this from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in order to have that haqqul yaqeen oh yes I found the um, sorry I found the, the ayah which I was looking for وَكَذَلِكَ نُورِ إِبْرَاهِيمَ مَلَكُوتَ السَّمَوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ وَلِيَكُونَ مِنَ الْمُوْقِنِينَ and in this way we showed Ibrahim the dominions of the heavens and the earth so that he can become من المغنين, those who have certainty this certainty of the haqqul yaqeen type not the ilmul yaqeen because he had that no, no, this, no here this مغنين of the anul yaqeen type so here he had anul yaqeen too but in this story now he wants haqqul yaqeen he wants to be a manifestation of the attribute al muhi so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says Qala awalam tu'min So he wants to see how Allah brings the dead alive again And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says Don't you believe this already? Hazrat Ibrahim says Qala bala Of course I do There's no problem there Walakin liyatma'inna qalbi It's for this certainty of the heart Now he had ilmul yaqeen and aynul yaqeen before this is referring, according to Allah Jawali, to this haqqul yaqeen stage. It's for this stage I want to see this attribute of yours and acquire it. Now, prophets were ma'soom, were infallible. The sins which are in the sharia, they were far from it. And they would never commit any sin, they would never commit any error. They may commit deficiencies, deficiencies which are not uh, a deficiency for us but I mean it gets so minute that for them they feel it's deficient and that's because of the, them seeing Allah they think that this may be a deficiency but for us that's not a deficiency for example here the deficiency would be they want to at attain to that haqqul yaqeen stage they feel they're deficient until they reach that high stage all the prophets were ma'sum and in that sense they're equal but naturally there were differences between them. The Holy Prophet of Islam was the highest amongst all prophets, faith-wise, action-wise, everything. Yes. The attributes of Allah, he had acquired all of them in the most complete sense. But other prophets, maybe they weren't in that complete as the Prophet of Islam. However, they were all ma'soom though. The important thing is, okay, this is a deficiency for Hazrat Ibrahim. But we have to learn from this from our deficiencies which are sins according to the Sharia this is the essence behind this story now that how can we relieve ourselves and be free from things which prevent us from seeing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and not allowing us to attain to our maximum Okay, so قَالَ أَوَلَمْ تُؤْمِنْ Don't you believe? As the Ibrahim says, بَلَا وَلَكِنْ لِيَتْمَعِدْنَ غَلْبِي It's for that certitude, for that certainty. Here comes the protocol now, which Allah gives. And this will help us when we want to see Allah, to follow this protocol. قَالَ فَخُذْ Now, this is the external side, then I'll go into the esoteric side. قَالَ فَخُذْ أَرْبَعَةً مِنَ التَّيْرِ فَصُرْحُنَّ إِلَيْكِ Take four birds, any four birds, and I'll explain what, which birds he took. Fasorhunna ilaik. Fasorhunna, some translators translate as destroy them into pieces. Okay, Javadi doesn't accept this translation. He, he uses uh, domesticate them. Now, to explain this domestication will make, take some time. Uh, but we'll keep with it destroying the birds from piece to piece. The story was this, that he, he chose four birds, the peacock, the duck, the cock or rooster, and the vulture. In some traditions, it, instead of the vulture, it, it's, they speak of the crow. He destroyed these four birds, blended the carcasses of the four birds together, he kept as a Ibrahim, he kept the necks to himself, but the the bodies were all they all 
blended with one another. And then he put each part of the carcasses, which were all blended now with one another, each on a mountain peak. Then the verse says, Thummaj al ala kulli jabalin, then assign each part on a mountain peak, on, well, on a mountain, min hunna juz'a, a part of each on each peak, thummad uhunna ya'tina kasa'ya, then call upon them and they'll come to you in haste. They'll come to you quickly. And when they came to, um, towards the Prophet, he had the next with him. He will sometimes move the next from place to place to see, you know, how these blended pieces of dead birds, you know, how they separate from other. So sometimes he would move the next from place to place and see how each body part would go to the neck of that respected bird. Okay? So that's the external meaning. And this happened. We don't negate any external meaning of the Quran. They all happened. And we're not allowed to negate them just because of the esoteric dimensions. The esoteric, esoteric dimensions are always in conformity with the exoteric side. Now here, the four birds which were to be destroyed and put, cut into pieces, one was the peacock. The peacock is the symbol of the ego. The peacock is very arrogant, it's well known. The peacock's love of beauty. These are the vices which one has to destroy in oneself. This is the esoteric side. If you want to see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, this how by elimination of the ego, elimination of a number of vices. These birds represent a number of vices. With the peak, it, it was the ego, the love of one's beauty. With the duck, it was the love of materialism, because the duck, you know, it collects things for itself and is even ready to eat, you know, dead carcasses. It's known for this attribute. The cock is known for its very high sexual appetite. You have to control it. I'm not, I'm not putting sex you know, aside or anything. Everything you know, has to be in order. Not, you shouldn't overdo things. Now, those traditions which speak of the craven, that can be a symbol of overeating. Eating is good, but that also has to be done in order. You shouldn't overeat. Those who speak of the vulture, okay, vultures are known of, known of ha being very, um, having these long, wishing for something for long periods of time. Do you know when they keep on flying in the air, waiting for something? They want to eat, for example, their prey, or wait for something to rot or something, and they keep on waiting. They desire, they desire, they have very long desires. Amalun tawil, amal with the hamza. Amalu tawil, you shouldn't want something too much. Something, sometimes you shouldn't insist on attaining to something. These vices which are shared by these birds, if we manage to destroy them and eliminate them, then we can also see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's the message from this qissa of the Qur'an, the story. That's what we have to do. So inshallah, as I say, I'll speak about a number of stories um, in the next few days. And I'll continue. In the last session, we spoke about seven stages. And we'll continue with the different stages from, we'll speak about sorrow, fear, hope, sacrifice, and a number of other phases in sp spiritual wayfaring throughout the two weeks inshallah uh, thank you for listening wa sallallahu ala muhammad wa ala tahiri